Welcome. I've been expecting you. We're inside the Matrix with the one and only Ryan Blair. Hey, Ryan. Pleasure to be here at your presence inside the Matrix. Thank you. Tell me about uh, your journey escaping the Matrix. What was, that? what was that download you first had that you needed to escape the Matrix? Well, you know, I was raised in a family that I needed to escape from. It was very traumatic. I had an abusive father, a mother who was an alcoholic. And so I had to escape from my environment at a very early age. I would I'd go just wandering around in the wilderness, and I was always trying to escape. But then from the actual corporate matrix that we live in right now, I think the first time I, I pulled out was uh, when my mother passed away in 2017. I realized that it was all one big scam, that the world that we live in and the lies that we're told and what we believe and every, all of it was just one big scam. Yeah. And did you feel at that time, because at that time you would, from the eyes of the society, you are seen as this, one of the most successful entrepreneurs at the time. In fact, I remember, yeah. and I'm going to, you might not, I'm, a, I'm like part historian, part inside. Was, yeah. like, I know what's going on. And you were the first entrepreneur that I felt had like a powerful personal brand. Mm -hmm. And at the time there was like, maybe like you and it was like, maybe like Tony Robbins, maybe a little bit, not even Tony was doing like movies, but like entrepreneurs, like, like real guys that you could look up to, it was Ryan Blair. Hmm. And, you know, from my eyes, from my perspective, it was like, oh, this guy has it all, all right? But you saw, okay, I was stuck in this. Yeah, this, yeah that, this that's the irony. A lot of people tell me that, that it looked like, you know, because I had flossed the, the, the you know, the fleet of cars and the jet and the mansions. And I had all of those, those things and the material things that, that we all covet in our consumer-based society. And what I realized at that moment that I lost my mother was that I'd throw it all away. It was all, it was all worthless. All the things that I thought were valuable to me were no longer valuable. And I, uh, I went through a total rebirth process in that moment because I had spent my whole life propelled by the trauma that I had endured to achieve great things. But that fuel source that powered me was a toxic source. So with that source came lots of challenges, lots of failed relationships, lots of, of you know, pain. And I just realized that there had to be a better, better way, a better fuel source. So I, you know, I broke free from the materialistic consumer pursuit that mm -hmm. most people are on. And uh, and you know rebuilt myself from scratch basically, and I said I don't care. I said the Ryan Blair that everybody knows is gone. What do you value right now? What do I value? I mean the the thing that I value the most is love. You know, I look at it as fuel sources, and what what fuel source can I utilize now that has the most sustainability, and that I can operate with and have the most joy with, and the most health with. And, and so love is a fuel source, but it's not an easy one. It's easier than it sounds. Like, oh yeah, let's, let's all just attach to love. You only can learn to really attach to the fuel source of love after you've learned what love is not. Mm. And I spent most of my life learning what love was not so that I could really value love in such a way that I could use it in my work and and, and use it as a way to propel me in life. So it's a contrast in your life that's giving you perspective. Yeah, the, the, what I tell people is, is it's, we have to learn how to dance with these opposing forces. And when we learn how to harness two opposing forces together is when you get that real tension and that real friction. And that friction is great. It's like people will say, oh, you need to be more patient or you need to be uh, more grateful. Those are important fuel sources. But you need to learn how to marry gratitude with ambition, or you need to learn how to marry patience with persistence. Mm -hmm. And if you marry patience with persistence, then you can be a phenomenal yeah, individual. That's where it's, that's where it's but at. But if somebody tells me, go be patient, I'm like, okay, I'll just sit around and wait for something good to happen. 
well, then you get nowhere. So one says, go be grateful. Okay, well, I'll just sit around appreciating everything I've got and never want anything more than what I already have, and then I'll get nowhere, right? So you have to have gratitude with ambition. You have to have patience with persistence. You have to marry uh, opposing fuel sources and mm -hmm. then learn to sit in the middle of those two opposing forces and call upon each force as you need to be able to propel you. I've been struggling recently with like the concept of desire yeah. because it's, it's almost seemed like the whole, especially like in the spiritual space or even in like religion, in my religion, like desire is almost seen like as a negative thing. Yeah. What do you think about desire? Is it, is it positive, is it negative? What, how do I? Yeah, so d desire is interesting. So there are many different traditions and this is why the world is so confusing. One tradition will tell you desire is the root cause of all suffering. Right, and that's one tradition. Another tradition will tell you desire is everything, and desire is the only thing that you need to cultivate to be successful. And then we're sitting here saying, what do I do? Mm -hmm. One master is telling me desire is the root cause of suffering. Another master is telling me desire is all I need to cultivate. So it's, it's quite confusing. So we have to look at our own definition of what desire is. And if you're desiring to grow, if you're desiring to heal so that you can help heal others. If you're desiring to know your soul and know your purpose and you're cultivating the desire inward as opposed to desire outward, then desire is a very good thing. But like anything, it has a negative pull and a positive pull. Mm -hmm. It can be taken uh, in the direction of suffering and it can be taken into the direction of light. And the idea is that we want to understand the negative energy behind desire and the positive energy behind it and then cultivate the positive energy with it. But do you want to know a cheat code? I know this is your thing, right? Yeah, I, I want to get to the cheat code. That's do you want to know a cheat code about desire? What is it? To pray for the desire to have more desire. Mm. So the idea, if you think about this, it's actually quite interesting. How big is my vessel for my desire? And how much desire do I have in me? And I now want to pray for the desire to build more desire within me. Because the same thing is like, I, I want desire, yeah. but the whole world tells me desire is not good for you. No. So I feel like, you know, in this world where we're coming into, in this a era of like NPCs and AI, GPTs, like they, GPTs don't have desire. No. So that separates me as a human being yeah. to AI. Yeah. So like, I feel like I need to understand desire to the ultimate level of like the way you see it yeah. you know, and thank you for sharing all this yeah. that's a cheat code yeah <laughs> because then i can structure myself to have desire be a positive influence in my life yeah de desire can be amazing if it's the right desire if mm -hmm. it's a desire that has intention behind it if it's a desire that has precision so if i'm if i'm desiring growth what's wrong with that if every day i wake up and i say i want to increase my desire for growth if I have a small desire for growth, I'm gonna get small growth. If I have a big desire for growth, like an appetite, think of it as mm -hmm. my appetite, I am hungry for growth. Then if I'm hungry for growth, what's my day look like? What's my life look like? Every challenge that comes my way is growing me. My desire is, is, is channeled in the appropriate direction. But if my desire is for ego or vices, or my desire conversely is for um, you know, power, well, then it can be you know, a, a negative force. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of people will say, just get rid of desire altogether and humanity will quit suffering. But, but desire is, is, is neither negative nor positive. It's the point of your desire that mm -hmm. you have to be very intentional about. Now you live in like, you live in Hollywood Hills. I mean, you're, you look like a model. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> you got all the, the you know, the traits of somebody that I would feel like there's temptation all, over, all yeah. around you. Yeah. How do you handle temptation? I try to handle it the same way Jesus handled it. Mm. You know, um, even Jesus was tempted. And Jesus is based on my tradition, but I love all traditions, so I'm not just here to talk about that. But in the story of the Bible where he was tempted by the devil, not once, not twice, but three Good times. Time. So I know that all of us temp are tempted. And I have been tempted many times, and I have fallen to my temptations on many, many occasions. So I want to tell you, I'm a subject matter expert <laughs> in temptation. I'm asking the right man yeah, right yeah, now. Like yeah. If you want to know about how, what not to do. So temptation is, and there's a lot of different types of temptations. There's lust temptations. There's power temptations. There's ego temptations. There's greed temptations. There's the lower self temptations. And then some people believe that there's an opponent 
in the case of the Bible story of Jesus, the actual devil himself is seeding you with temptation to try to stop you from fulfilling your soul's purpose. Mm -hmm. The devil was trying to offer Jesus the power of being king in the human domain, but to relinquish the king of the universe title so that he could become king of the earth. And of course, Jesus said no to the temptation, but he was tempted. When we are tempted, the first thing to do is is ask for forgiveness, to repent. Uh, If we're just tempted, it's not bad if we're tempted in thought. But when we take that temptation into an action, it's, there's more brevity to it. It's, it's more of a uh, sin, for example. The thought is a sin, but then the action is a sin as well. And so we have to repent for those. And every time we fall into temptation with thought, we repent. And if we can catch it before it turns into an action, we'll That's eventually build a mental framework around temptation to where when it comes, you might go, oh, I'll look. No, I'm not interested. Right? And so you'll build a mindset that is temptation resistant. It'll never be per- the enemy or the opposing force or the negative energy, whatever your belief system is, it's trying to find every door it can to stop you from, from mm-hmm. getting to your next level. It's like the girl in the red dress. It's, that's it. So as that happens, you know, you, you have to give the devil his due and you have to say, oh, okay, that was a temptation and thought. I'm going to work on that. And the secret to that is you, as soon as you have a negative thought, you ask yourself, what is the alternative positive thought to that? And then you evaluate the underlying misbelief or misconception that you're believing in. And eventually, if you do that enough times, you'll build resistance toward the common temptations and even advanced temptations. But there'll always be something new coming your way that you're not expecting. The key is to build a mental framework to where you catch it before it turns into action. Yeah, a lot of the apostles went through... Um, they went, or saints, they've, they've gone through like being like murderers or, yeah. you know, committing adultery to becoming, you know, yeah. representatives yeah. of how to, how to be. Yeah. One, one of the things that's fascinating about this is, um, uh, you know, the apostles had no idea who they were dealing with. They had no idea. They were living in the house of Jesus. They had no idea they were in the company of Jesus. Like they, they had some suspicions. They saw some miracles. They saw him doing some rad stuff that no one else could do ever. But they had no idea. And it took them many, many years after his, his transition to really understand what they were living with. What just had happened. And these are the people that are the most revered human beings in the history of our society. You know, the 13 of them together, right? Mm-hmm. So, when, when, you know, like we're not going to get it right the first time. They didn't get it right the first time. They didn't get it right for many years after he had been murdered. And so, you know, it gives us all some, some grace that we're not gonna get it right the first time. How important do you feel like um, religion um, is gonna play a role in this next chapter now, like the post AI revolution? How, how big is religion gonna be? Is it gonna be affected? I had the pre- my priest ask me like, Jeff, you need to find ways to help like the, the church. Yeah. And, I, and I thought about it like, well, there's no, much, there's no amount of money that I can give to the church that would actually make a difference. I mean, yeah. maybe to a certain degree, but like, how do you see like your role in, not necessarily religion, forget religion, like just um, being a testament or being a, a force, I guess a force to, to good yeah. in this next chapter. Yeah. Te- consider technology, consider religion, consider where we're at in culture. Dude, we had the craziest week. Yeah. Like, Snoop Dogg quit yeah. smoking weed. We had uh, Sam Altman. Yeah. We'll talk about that right now. Got fired as a CEO from, from the biggest AI company in the world. And then we had uh, P. Diddy's like being called the devil. Like so, so many crazy things yeah. are happening. Uh, yeah, Elon Musk had uh, anti-Semitic comments. We have the war happening in uh, Israel, the mm-hmm. war happening in Ukraine, right? We're in some very uncertain times right now. The... Um, you know, the, the objective is, is to spread as much light as you possibly can, and that's just it. And in order to spread a lot of light, you have to have met a lot of darkness. The darker your, your path, the more light you can share. I've been on a dark path. I've, I've, I've met the devil himself on many occasions. And so I can, I can tell you that, you know, my job is to shine a lot of light to the best of my ability. And I try to cultivate... Uh, my character and my competency around doing that. 
Now, what's going on with, with AI is an absolute evolution of humanity. I'm afraid of a future that doesn't have spirituality infused in AI. Mm -hmm. And AI is only as good as the people who train it. And so in our company, Alter Call, we are training our AI, AI to be modeled after the spiritual values that I'm here teaching. And my hope is that Alter Call will have a voice in the future of AI and that we'll be able to ensure a future that has spirituality infused into it. Because I'm not worried about other people doing AI. I'm worried about no one doing AI the way we are, spiritually infusing AI into our training models yeah. and then ensuring that there is spirituality in AI in the future. So, you know, the world's, the world's changing all around us all the time and the rate of evolution is faster than ever. And, you know, it's, I think, the most exciting time to be alive, but I think it's gonna require a lot of people to step up and say, you know, we're joining this, this race. We don't want AI to only be built by these uh, powerful Silicon Valley tech, technology executives that are devoid of a soul, yeah. that are seek, they're power hungry, that are seeking to gain as much power as they possibly can. We don't want our future to be controlled 100% by those individuals. We need people that are a part of the consciousness movement, that are part of the spiritual movement, to step up and join this race. Otherwise, we're going to have a future that will have no spirituality in it. Where right now, over 80% of humanity believes in a higher power, but the people that are building the AIs, for the most part, do not. Mm, so we have to be very careful yeah. about the onslaught coming toward us as spiritual individuals. If we don't join this war, we're gonna have some problems. So, so you say that 80%, like 80% of people have a, have a sense of believing in, in the higher power. Yeah. The 20%, they just don't, like you said atheists yeah. or? Either, either atheists or just have no belief in a higher power whatsoever. Yeah, so do you feel like uh, the world be, would be definitely a better place if we were at 100%? No, I think the 20% keep us spiritual people nice and balanced. They, they oppose our arguments. They keep us in check. I think that there needs to be uh, balances. And I think that the atheist actually has a, a, a spiritual role. I think everybody has a role, whether they acknowledge it or not. Um, I see the creator's craftsmanship in everything even in the person that doesn't recognize it. Like I can see the creator's work in the life of an atheist, even when they don't see it themselves. Mm. Um, I have to ask you a question because I know the audience is probably thinking about this. Yeah. You mentioned right now, you met the devil himself multiple times. <laughs> yeah. can, can you share, I mean, anything you want to share yeah. about that? Like, I don't want to poke too no, much. No, please, like, please, yeah. Like, um, well, when you've gone to jail like I have, um, and you know, I, when I was a child, I was in juvenile detention center a number of times, and you see people that, in their eyes, they have become what I would say is possessed. And the reason why I called my book Nothing to Lose, my first book, was because I look into those people's eyes, and I would see they had absolutely nothing to lose. They would murder you in a second if they could, and many of them murdered many people and had not an ounce of remorse about it, and they would do it again if they were allowed to. And when you've experienced human beings like that, you realize that there is a dark force out there. It is very intelligent, and you do not want to encounter it in a dark alley. And I've been in those dark alleys, and I've met that dark force, and I've seen it in the eyes of many people. I've, been, I've literally faced the flash of a muzzle before. I've had somebody try to shoot me before. And you know, I, I know what it's like when you're dealing with an evil force. And they, I believe wholeheartedly that there is an evil force out there. There is a divine intelligence. We call that the light. And then there's an evil force, we call that the dark. And that's what makes the system go. So it's not that it's bad, like you need these two opposing forces. But when one force gets more steam, the other force has to oppose it. Mm -hmm. And so we're in this grand balancing act that's occurring right now. And it's my belief that in humanity, the dark force is winning. And so we have to figure out a way to balance that out. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, which is one of the reasons that I'm passionate about what I do and the people that I get behind and uh, being part of, like, building personal brands is not about the followers. Yeah. It's about what that personal brand is doing yeah. in the world. And that's, it's about the light. I, yeah. I, I, mean, I told Vixie years ago, like, you look at your feed, I'm not necessarily Vixie's, anybody's feed, you know, there's a lot of uh, clowns, I, was, I call them clowns, like a lot of clowns in this space, and my kids are watching yeah. that. That's influencing my kids more than I am. Yeah. So we need more people like you 
on the feed. I think I always I always tell the people, my friends, I'm like, we need more. You gotta post more. Yeah. We need more of you. Yeah. The dark is winning. Yeah. You know, we need more light. Have you had a, a direct? I mean, so you had you've encountered the devil. Have you encountered Jesus? Yeah. Jesus, you oh, yeah. felt Jesus. Oh yeah. Tell me about that. Uh, well, on every we're coming up on the holidays here, and so I'll tell you a practice of mine. Where most people, you know, at Christmas are, they're they're doing the consumer version of Christmas. I'm actually using that day to go as deep as I possibly can into my relationship with Jesus. And I do that more than just Christmas. But on that day in particular, I set aside time and I go deep. And I'm talking, my meditation might last for four, five, six hours that day as I go deep into his energy. I utilize that day. Some people say, well, that's not his real birthday. And there's all this stuff. It's like, no. If you get enough people calling a name at the same time, where two or more are gathered, great things happen. So... I try to harness the collective force of that energy of that day and make that connection to the best that I possibly can. So yeah, um, I, I've felt the love of Jesus. I've experienced the healing energy of Jesus. My whole life uh, is uh, specific, has been saved. Yeah. Was there a specific moment that you, like that you felt it? Like is it was defining? Well, I, I was, was so it? I was always reigned. Uh, I was always raised as uh, in a pretty devoted religion. I lost my way from that, but. When my mother transitioned, I went back to my spiritual roots, and I made a vow to her as she was dying that when she went to the other side, that I would change my ways because I would never do the things I was doing with my mother in the room. And I knew that my mom would be able to see me at all times. Mm. And so I didn't want her to see me doing drugs and spending the time that I was spending with the people I was spending it with. So I made a vow to her. I said, once you go, I change. And I changed at that moment. And I can feel the pre her presence guiding me. She often visits me in my dreams. I'm deeply connected to her, more so than ever. And as a mama's boy, I just I decided to change my ways uh, when she passed away. Yeah. Oh, man. Beautiful. And you, you, I remember you went through, uh, I don't know if this was public or not, but you went through a moment of silence. Yeah. How long was that silence? All about... Well, it was, you know, I went two years, I went into an internal state where I went and worked on myself. I cut off relationships. I cut out, cut out business altogether. I spent two years. Of that two years, I spent about 90 days uh, without talking to another soul. And of that 90 days, there were times where I didn't even say a word, you know, out of my mouth uh, for days on end. So it was a vow of silence. Um, Beyond the vow of silence, I would spend during the two years more than six to seven hours a day in meditation on average. There were days where I would go to, I would wake up in the morning, it would be dark out, and I'd start meditating. I'd open my eyes and it would still be dark out. And I'd be like, is it only like an hour passed? It turned out 10 hours had passed. Wow. Yeah. Downloads? Revelations. Revelations. Yeah, Revelations. Are you, are you writing about that? Is, is there a book coming? What's going on? Yeah. The, I want to know. Yeah. I want the cheat codes. Yeah. I, so I've written a lot of them, and I, I'm blessed to have a process to where I open up my, my antenna to receive, and as I get these revelations, I share them with as many people as I possibly can in the movement that I'm building at Altar Call. Uh, so far, I've had about 800 uh, uh, lessons, frameworks, principles, practices that I've developed and polished, and I'm training an AI on those to teach our people. What is the, what is the favorite one? What is the top one? Oh, I've got I've got many of them, but um, you know I, I've got a number of them that that I, I lean on heavily, and some of these principles have come to me. Like for example, healing is painful was one that I needed very close to me mm -hmm. while I was going through the healing process. Uh, the further you go, the further you see is another one that came to me that, you know, every, every step I would see a little further because I was in real dark times. And so I would just keep, you know, re-embodying re that principle. Uh, mindfulness is injury-free is another one. Every time I stub my toe, I remind myself that if I was being mindful, I wouldn't have stubbed my toe. And stubbing my toe might not just be a physical act. It might be that I said something that wasn't quite kind to a person or I got into a conflict I didn't need to, or I didn't give the person the, the type of attention that they deserved, or I wasn't there for my son the way I should have, and I remind myself that mindfulness is injury-free. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly seeking to embody these principles, 
principles are like a cheat code in your operating system. And when you have that code in the system, you just call upon it. And it's like when I stub my toe, I'm like, mindfulness is injury free. Mm. And I remind myself that, you know, pick up your feet when you walk, be mindful when you walk, right? Uh, you know, and if I stub my, my toe in a relationship, so to speak, I'll remind myself that, you know, I'm, I'm a work in progress. And uh, I'm, I'm constantly every day attempting to build character and competency. And this is an opportunity. This conflict is an opportunity for me to do that. Do you still spend a lot of time alone? Yes. Is it, is it a daily practice where you're, you're by yourself? Is it? Yeah. Yeah, I... I imagine you're like Tesla in this lab and you're just like, yeah. nobody bother me for the next three, four hours downloading. Yeah, I, I get up um, very early and, and I, I have a, a practice that a lot of people will talk about routines. And I, Alex Ramosi recently said that uh, routines were, were stupid and that you know, they didn't necessarily, uh, you know, they weren't effective and so forth. And with regard to routines, I, I agree with him that routines aren't necessarily um, the most important thing, but rituals. 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 I like that. Right? Yes. So I don't have a routine. A routine is boring. And Alex Hermosi is right to that extent. Routines are stupid. But a ritual, that's powerful. And so I have morning rituals, not morning routines. So I wake up, I meditate, I pray, I study, I work out, I eat healthy, and I seize the day. And that's my ritual. Mm -hmm. It's not my routine. What are, you, what are you studying right now? Is there something specific you're studying? I'm always uh, studying something new, but I, I probably have four or five books come a week. I don't read them all, but I, I draw from them. Some I schedule, some I carry with me. You know, I, I like to read other people's works on subjects. I, I tend to read books that have two categories, one in character and one in competency. And so I might be reading a book that's gonna help me with the technical competency that I'm seeking to learn around, say, uh, speaking or marketing or whatever the technical competency is. And then on the character side, I'm reading spiritual books. Uh, and I always have a Bible uh, where I do my, my, my rituals. And I open that up and I go in and, and grab a quote from it and, or you know, grab a word from it, I should say, and uh, you know, try to interpret it and draw from it. What's your favorite scripture? I have many. One, one that... Well, you know, I'll tell you... Um, uh, a lot of the Psalms have really impacted me. Mm. And every year I follow a tradition where I take my birth, uh, my, my, my years, I'm 46, so I take 46 plus one, so I'm reading Psalm, Psalm 47, for example. Mm. Um, and every year I really contemplate on one Psalm. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a ton of scripture that I'm inspired by. King David is one of my favorite stories. Um, I'm also very uh, connected to Joshua in the Bible. Uh, I often tell people that, um, that Noah built an ark for animals and that at Altar Call, we're called to build an ark for people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm biblically empowered in everything that I do. What do you consider yourself? Like, what would be your label? Because you're an entrepreneur, but like, what, like, you're not just an entrepreneur. What, like, what? One of my principles is labels are for shampoo, mm. which means just like, who cares about labels, right? Yeah. But people like to label you, and, and sometimes it's good to have a label to help you build some skill and to, to focus you. Because if I said, oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm uh, oneness, and I'm the <laughs> universal light, it's like, well, what are, you, what are you working on? It's like, I'm working on nothing and everything at the same time. A lot of people in the spiritual community they get really caught up in the ether and in the abstract. And I like to get you know, focused on the concrete. But, so is that positive and negative? Is that those, yeah. those, those, what you said earlier? Like yeah. you have to get to the opposing sides. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to cultivate as much personal will and personal power as I can in this, this journey here. But you know, I, I'm an entrepreneur and, and uh, that's, you know, that's what I've, I've always done. And an entrepreneur is a, you know, it's a simple uh, definition for entrepreneur. It's one who takes risk which faith could be spelt R-I-S-K, right? That's yeah. what, that risk and faith are, are the same thing. Um, so, right, so entrepreneurship is one of the most spiritual professions that you possibly can have because it requires you to take risk. And to take risk, you have to have faith. And it's one who organizes. And so administration is actually a spiritual gift. So if you take risk and you organize, you are having faith and you're administering that faith. Mm -hmm. And that's a spiritual uh, vocation. 
So my, I always tell people I'm seeking to put the spirit back into entrepreneurship. And that's why I tell people about spiritual entrepreneurship all the time, because it's a way of doing entrepreneurship in a spiritual way, where you're utilizing uh, your spirituality to in, inform every decision that you make and to use spirituality to build your team and, and to really be powered by the ultimate spirit in entrepreneurship. And so that's the, the, the thing that I'm doing. But I would tell you entrepreneurship is probably the most spiritual vocation that one can engage in. And many people don't understand it. When they're, whether they're successful or they're failing as an entrepreneur, they're fighting the spiritual fight by way of the game of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Because you have to be humble to be an entrepreneur. You're gonna get corrected. You're gonna get opportunities for improvement. You're gonna let people down. You're gonna have to grow in character. You're gonna have to grow in competency. There's nothing that will grow you uh, as a vocation faster than entrepreneurship will. You're gonna have to learn to deal with suffering. So you feel entrepreneurship has uh, given you purpose in life? Yeah, the, I, I, w I would tell you that, that the desire to serve others gives me purpose. And when you're an entrepreneur and you have a, a good sized team and a good sized amount of customers, mm -hmm. you have, your, your job is to serve others. So it forces you into service. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like your, your service to others is to start with servicing yourself and your immediate team, like your actual, your apostles? Or is it directly, we're all as a unit, we're here to serve our end user, our customer, our client? You know, it depends. Sometimes it? in order for me to serve my customer, I have to serve my team. I have to go work with a team member and mm -hmm. I can get them aligned and activated and they go serve the customers. Sometimes. Um, I go work and serve the customers. It just depends on the season that you're in as an entrepreneur and where you're at in the stage of evolution of your, your company. But it's a very um, uh, spiritual thing to me. So I'll look at the feedback that I'm getting from my team, from my customers, and then I'll make the decision of where I'm, call, where I'm called to serve. And uh, I do that on a daily basis. Some days I spend more time in service to my family. Other days I spend more time in service to my company. Excuse me, and that's all dependent upon the uh, you know the feedback that I'm receiving from my environment. Mm -hmm. I get I get it. It's it's, it's dance. You're dancing with it. You're I'm feeling old, it. It's, I'm you're, dancing. You're, 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 I'm, you're in the moment. You're yeah. present, and you're making decisions based on that. Yeah, I'm 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 uh, I'm connected to the energy of the moment, and I'm asking myself, you know, how do I align with this energy the best, and how do I, uh, you know, increase the the vibrational frequency of the moment and, and raise the energy up. And sometimes people are going through a rough spot that I can give them some, some help with. And sometimes people you know, are on fire and I just want to pour gasoline on it. Fire them up. Yeah. Get them going. Yeah, get sometimes. It yeah. just depends though. Sometimes I'm there to, to witness a, a young man on his journey and say, look, I've been there too. I know what you're going through and let me help you through this. Let me help you not make the same mistakes I have. Sometimes I'm there to talk to an elder and learn from them and take notes. You know, every moment um, the universe is trying to send you all the help you need, all the mentorship you need, is for us to develop an ability to receive it. That is what makes the spiritual journey so exciting and, and so unique. It's not about giving as much as it's about learning to receive. Do you feel like, um, well, let's talk about, I want to talk about altar call a little yeah. bit because um, I feel like uh, as you went through this, I guess, rebirth, Alter Call was also yeah. born. Yeah. And from what I've heard, I've heard stories, um, and I've never actually heard it from you, but I've heard stories that the first time you actually um, made an Alter Call event was, happened to f be on the birthday of your mother. Is yeah. That yeah. The truth? Uh, on, their, on their anniversary. I know it's her passing. Of her yeah. passing, and that happened by coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The, uh, we are trying to find a date to do an event, and one of the team members, our co-founder Brian Ferrari, suggested that day, and I just knew. I was like, "Okay, mom, we're doing it on your day." Wow. It was two years after she transitioned. I I wasn't sure how it was going to work out, but I knew that I was supposed to somehow turn the worst day of my life into uh, a day of deep meaning, and it became that. And now, on the anniversary of her passing, I have something to celebrate as well as something to mourn. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's beautiful. So what exactly, um, for the people that have never heard of Alter Call, what exactly is Alter Call? Uh, Alter Call is a, 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 um, 
uh, a movement that is teaching entrepreneurs how to infuse spirituality into their, their work. And we're innovating in AI. We're uh, helping people basically take their spirituality, infuse it in their business, and have their business become a embodiment of their spiritual purpose on mm -hmm. the planet. Entrepreneurship can be very difficult. Um, it can be very challenging. People suffer greatly through entrepreneurship. And so we help alleviate that suffering by way of helping them see it as a spiritual opportunity for them to grow and then for them to actually build their business in such a way to where they're going to maximize their freedom and maximize their ability to grow as an individual. So we're advocating for this idea of spiritual entrepreneurship. We're teaching every entrepreneur we can get our hands on uh, how to, to do entrepreneurship in a spiritual way. Yeah, because if, I mean, I feel like, you know, I mean, I go through it as well. Like you get to these points where you feel like when I hit this mile marker, I'm going to be good. But yeah. then you hit that mile marker and you're broken. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of it's a lot of it's caused because you you get lost in the, you just get lost. You go yeah. you go too far. You're disconnected. And actually, one of the things that I wanted to share with you is that one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because I feel like you're one of the most connected persons. Mm -hmm. You're and when I'm saying, I say connection is like it's not just connection within. It's also connection to the world, but also connected. You're very connected to culture. You understand what's really happening, yeah. and. Thank you. Um, um, in this new era, where, which we've been going through, this we've all seen it like life. Every of my kids, I've seen it. This shift that's happening, uh, where AI is becoming partly integrated into every aspect of our lives. Yeah. Even our glasses have AI now. Yeah. You know, we have all these wearables that we can uh, integrate AI in, and um, becoming human and becoming connected seems to be like an afterthought. We want to be more disconnected. We want to yeah. be more. Uh, Instead of connect, connecting to our original thoughts, we're trying to seek answers from a um, chat GPT. Yeah. You know, so like I'll even I'll have people ask me like, "Hey, how can I write more scripts?" I'm like, "Go to your room, yeah, no distractions, and write more scripts. Yeah. You're too distracted. No, but how can I use chat GPT? Like, yeah, you can use chat GPT, but is it really connecting? Yeah, yeah. So con your, your connection is a a very powerful energy. And it's something that we should spend a lot of time learning and, and cultivating. The, the steps that I took to become connected to the level that I am, and I'm still growing my connection every day, is one, I became connected to the earth, to the planet, to mother nature, to the moon, to the stars, to the sun, to the environment, to the trees, to the animals. I became connected to earth. We're disconnected from that. Mm -hmm. Many of us you know, don't appreciate the moon. We don't appreciate you know, mother nature. And as a result, we're disconnected from the the mother of, of, our, uh, of our planet, Mother Nature. So that's, that's connection level one. And then from there, once you're connected to the earth, you can then be connected to a higher power. And then from there, you can be connected to your brothers and sisters that are also children of that earth and that higher power. And then from there, you can be connected to uh, other various things. But spirituality is about two things, about being connected up and being connected to your fellow uh, humans. So a lot of times we, uh, make a mistake in our connection that we focus all on our connection to our higher power and not enough on our connection to our you know, fellow brothers and sisters on the planet or connection to the environment or mother nature. So to develop a, a strong connection, you have to be connected to all of those components and, and you have to actually work on that. The other thing in order to develop a powerful connection is you have to um, be very conscious of anything that disconnects you. Fear, is going to take you out of alignment with the divine. Greed, ego, all of those uh, items are gonna take you out of your connection. And so there's a time when you feel connected, you're in flow, you have synchronicity, you're experiencing the world, and it's operating in such a way where you're like, this is out of this world. This is like the next level of the video game. And then when you fall out of connection, you're like, this place doesn't feel so good. Mm. So every time you're disconnected, you have to ask yourself, what did I do to disconnect me? And then how do I get back into that alignment and then become reconnected? It's a process that I've been perfecting now in my own personal life for six plus years. It takes time to develop a connection and it's the most coveted thing that you can have once you have one. Yeah, so it's, it's more of a really, I mean, the whole concept of know thyself, really being self-aware 
and catch it. Yeah. You got to catch it that you're disconnected. Yeah. You could, you could be disconnected for years. Yeah. Yeah, I was. And, you know, I was. Yeah. you putting toxic substances in your body, uh, lusting, uh, many men watching porn, uh, men and women, but porn can disconnect you, toxic substances, toxic content, toxic ways of being, toxic ideas. And as you were mentioning earlier with you know, the many people that are influencing us out there, there are many people that are influencing us with toxic substances and it's just in the way of content or the way of their beliefs that they're sharing. And I promise you, if you follow certain people that are the major influences on the net right now, you will wind up in a place of suffering and despair at some point. And I can see, having been there, that many of them are heading in that direction. And I pray for them and you know, I wish them well, but when you see a person utilizing a strategy that will fail them eventually, you gotta be very careful, careful not to follow, follow them. Mm -hmm. Is it false, false idols? It's false idols. It's like, yeah, you know, there's toxic ways of being that people are, 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 you know, are modeling, and it looks like it's working. They're getting Ferraris, and they're getting private jets, and they're getting you know, all the luxuries that life has to offer. But what they're, what they're doing to get there is going to ultimately fail them. Yeah. And I, I just know that because we need to, we need to learn how to um, cultivate an internal willpower, an internal desire, uh, where we're not going to be subjected to the uh, materialism and consumerism that this massive economic engine that we're all a part of is constantly selling to us. And so if I'm buying into that consumerism and that materialism, and I'm doing so in a way where I'm attaching my identity to it and my value to it, that is a recipe for a disaster. Or you might live the rest of your life, but you'll, you'll do so in a way where you're going to have a toxic life and you're going to have a life that's going to have a lot more suffering in it than you need to. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you look at uh, the concept of arrogance? Is it a good thing? Because you're an entrepreneur, you got to have confidence, you got to be like, we're going to do this, guys, and people yeah. have to look at you as like, yeah, he believes it wholeheartedly, yes, we're going to do it. Yeah. So in order for people to follow you, you need some form of arrogance, some form of like... like you asked me my favorite scripture and I, it just came to me I was like, as I was digging. Um, and that is that uh, he who praises himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be praised. And that's by Matthew. And so he who praises himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be praised. So anytime I feel like when I am disconnected, I'll ask myself, where did my ego disconnect me? Where, did, where was I being arrogant? Mm -hmm. And I now have a, a cheat code that every time I'm like, I'm going to crush it. I'm like, by way of you, my creator. Yes. And I get on my knees and I humble myself. So I'm constantly trying to dance between the dualities of confidence and humility. You know, uh, people will tell you, you need to be humble. And I could sit there and be like, oh, I'm so humble. I'm just going to sit here all day long and, and do nothing. I'm just going to be humble and, and you'll get nowhere. You have to be able to dance the duality of humility and conviction, right? And what you get when you dance with the duality of humility and, and conviction, for example, is you get what we call in the spiritual world, holy audacity, mm. where you're audacious, you're unapologetic, you have no shame, you know exactly what you're going to do, and it looks like, wow, this person could be spiritually arrogant, it's no, this, this person is powered by holy audacity. They know who they're working for, they know who the boss is, they bow to the king every single day, they submit, they mm -hmm. obey, and they serve. And they serve. And that, that's my cheat code, is I call it the SOS framework. Submit, obey, and serve. And every time that I, I sense that I'm becoming a little arrogant, or my ego's getting the best of me, I feel a little disconnection or a big disconnection coming, I remind myself to submit, obey, and serve. Beautiful, man. We yeah. need some merch with that. Yeah. <laughs> SOS. SOS. Yeah, I just say I'm sending out an SOS, right? Like, yeah. you know, and, and before I have an interview like this with, you know, I'm, I'm humbled to be in your presence, man. I've known you like for what? quite some time. I've watched your star just blow up. It's humbling <laughs> to, to be here with a, a king right now. Yeah, <laughs> no, nah, man, SOS. Yeah, right? Yes, SOS. That's what it is. I honestly, like, I feel like, um, I, you know, I earlier I asked you about desire. I asked, now I asked you about arrogance because I asked you these questions because these are things that I, that I have to battle and, and deal with yeah. on the on the now day to day. They, now you got some. Now you got some. Uh, so, some notoriety. Yeah. So people were like, well, like you know, I was in I was in LA this past week, and you know, I was at a, an event, and somebody like called me out for wearing my shades, and like you know, calling me like a little bit of arrogant. Yeah. And I'm like, I know who I'm serving. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know what it. I'm doing. 
Yeah. And, um, you do you, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, so it's like, it's, you know, when I think about it, Jesus is for me the ultimate, you know, it's somebody I, every time I ask myself, like, am I doing this right or wrong? I try to see what would Jesus do in this situation? Yeah. And I feel like um, arrogance, when I think about arrogance and Jesus, I feel he would say, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, and then he would go do it. Yeah. So that could be seen as arrogant. Yeah. So, but there's a lot of power with saying, I am going to X, Y, Z. Yeah. In the name of, yeah. right? Well, that's called a declaration. A declaration. Yeah, so a declaration is a spiritual energy. And when you declare something, you unleash mighty forces behind you. Mm -hmm. That's one of the secret cheat codes to spirituality is I make declarations like Moses with his staff mm -hmm. on the ground. I declare that I'm changing my ways or I declare that I'm going to do things differently. One of the things that changed for me recently over the last few years is saying I am yeah. Even the smallest thing. Yeah. I'm going to wake up to go help my daughter yeah. take her to school. Yeah. Uh, little things. Yeah. And that I am and saying and always doing it, regardless of the situation, because it's so easy to just, oh, you know what, never mind. I, won't. I know I said it, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah. But I started doing the little things. Like, well, I am going to do this. I am going to do that. And, and, Slowly, that, that I am got bigger and yeah. bigger. And when, you're, bigger. when you're doing that, what, what you're doing, there's science to this as well as spirituality. You're taking something from the spiritual and you're turning it into the material. And that's, that's what we're trying to do here. That's why you take a thought and you journal it. And when you take a thought, you turn it into a thing. Now that thought is on a piece of paper. So you've taken the spiritual and you've turned it into the material. And that's the walk that we're trying to do. We're trying to work with the spiritual energy and the material energy. That's the entire walk of humanity. And if you can learn to master those dualities, like taking an I am and turning it into an action, then you're going you're gonna to do everything you've ever dreamed of in your life. That's the cheat code. That's the cheat code. Yeah. It's, it's, what, we've, what we don't realize is, once again, dancing with the dualities, it's like, I got to dance with the material. It's not that I don't want a nice car. Right? I got to learn how to have that nice car and be spiritual mm -hmm. and have that nice car as a way to exemplify the creator's craftsmanship in my life. And I gotta, you know, I gotta learn how to dance with that duality. And I can't let that car define me. I can't let that car be my identity. That car is gonna get me from place to place and it's gonna do so in a way that exemplifies the glory of God in my work. Now, if I do that, then that car is a great investment on behalf of the creator that you could ever make because that car is gonna sing the, the, the Lord's praises, right? But mm -hmm. if, if I do it in a way that sings my praises, then I've, I've lost the plot. I'm off mission. Yeah. And that car becomes a hindrance to me. And so that's the dance that people yes. don't understand is how to, how to dance with the material and the spiritual at the same time. And one of the secrets that I teach people or the cheat codes that I teach people is anything that's calling you, you just have to reverse it. And you have to learn to call it. So if something is calling me, like, oh, I want to I have that, that glass of wine, I got to say no. But if I call it, well, maybe a glass of wine is just fine. But if it's calling me, I got to learn to say no to it. If that... How do you know, though? How do you know it's calling you? Oh, man, I'll, I'll tell you one that calls me all the time. Like, if there's a bag of chips in my... In my uh, <laughs> okay, I get it. Right? <laughs> you know, a whole bag. Like, let's say there's, like, Cool Ranch, Doritos, or Takis. My son loves Takis. Mm -hmm. All of our children do. And he gets these big bags of Takis. I love them. Like, I could, that thing calls me. When it calls me, I got to be able to look at that bag of Takis and say... I'm not gonna eat it, not gonna eat a single one of them. Now I could call it and be like, you know what? I would like to enjoy the wonderful, delicious taste of Takis and the spiciness of it. I'm gonna have a couple of them, eat a few of them, and then not have to eat 50 of them and, and you know, and, and put a toxic substance in my body to that degree. But I mm -hmm. can have a little dance with that, but mm -hmm. I can't allow that thing to call me. I have to learn to call it. And life is about that, that dance right there. Anything that calls you, you need to get separation from because you should not allow anything to take you off mission. And if those talkies are gonna take you off mission, if that negative thought's gonna take you off mission, if that alcohol is gonna take you off mission, then you have to get separation from it. And you can call it, but it can't call you. Power. Yeah. That also works in bigger things like a business yeah. or a business venture, or yeah. should I invest in this? A shiny object syndrome. Yeah. Is it calling me or am I calling it? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the, 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 the dance, and by, by working through this, you learn this idea called restriction. So if that glass of wine is calling me, then I need to exercise restriction. I need to restrict that call, like, oh, you're calling me, I gotta, 
pulls some, gives some restriction. That restriction then builds my personal willpower and my discipline. And now, because I said no to that, I get to say yes to something even bigger than that. So every time something calls me and I learn to say no to it, I build a tremendous force of willpower and discipline within me. And even if it's small now, if I do that enough times with repetition, I'll build a big force within me. All of our spiritual armor and protection that we have is based on what we restrict, what we say no to. Steve Jobs used to like to say that focus is saying no. So these shiny objects and these different ideas that people are going to pitch at you, especially now that you got some money and some notoriety, you got to learn to say no to. Even if it's worth a million dollars, when you say no to something that's worth a million dollars, that means you're saying yes to something that's bigger than a million dollars. And so what will happen, though, is the universe will send you temptations, like, oh, here's a million dollar opportunity. You just have to distract yourself for, mo- for a little bit. And you're like, oh, I'd like to have make a quick million. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, you're off path. You're pulled back a couple levels. Yeah. So the secret is to learn how to say no to the things that are going to take you off mission and say no to a little light so you can say yes to even more light. Amen to that. I actually had recently, I mean, I'm t- this, this whole year has been, uh, you know, I'm grateful for, for all the opportunities that have come in. But uh, one, of the, one of my mentors told me, Jeff, say no to everything. Yeah. You decide what you want to do. Yeah. And I've said no to, every, I've not taken one brand deal, not one brand deal, yeah. the whole year. And what you just said right there, literally to the T has played out for me. Yeah. What's well, no. technology? Yeah, you're, you're, you're actually using technology when you say no. Saying yes is easy. You know, I'm, I'm friends with Tony Robbins and he teaches everybody, just say yes. Well, it's very convenient for him because when he offers you a trip to Fiji, you know, he just wants you to say yes, right? But I believe that there's, there's, there's once again a duality. We have to learn to dance with no and yes. Some people know how to say yes way too much, they need to learn to say no. Some people say no way too much, they need to learn how to say yes. Mm-hmm. This is the introvert versus extrovert, right? The introvert says no to everything. No to birthday parties, no to friends, no to going out, no to this, and they just stay home and, and they need to learn to say yes. Mm-hmm. The extrovert says yes to everything. They say yes to all, all these functions. They're always doing things for others. They're never having alone time or quiet time. They need to learn to say no. So it's a dance with dualities. There's, there's no wrong way or right way. It's finding your way that we all have to do. How much time do you spend like, um... For example, I'll, I'm, let me share a story. One of my favorite stories, um, have you seen The Chosen? Yeah. So one of my favorite episodes, season two, episode one of the seven or eight, one of the last were, where Jesus is on the mound with Matthew writing his scripture. Yeah. And he isolated himself from, from everybody to be able to get these downloads. Um, how much of that do you do? Three to four hours a day. But I'm, I'm trying to operate at like a monk level. That's not for everybody. Not everybody has that type of time. I'm, yeah. My goal is to um, rise to the highest level of spiritual capacity that I humanly can in this, this lifetime. So I have to spend three to four hours a day doing that. So, so you would say like the, the, your focus, because you mentioned Steve Jobs, and the focus saying no to other things in your life. So you're, you're pretty much saying no to other well, I, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I spend, let's say, three hours of a, a 12-hour day uh, in isolation and in doing my spiritual practices. And then the rest I work. And then, you know, I, but I, I used to be more. So this is another cheat code. It's the input-output ratio. So my input ratio when I was on my healing journey was tremendous. I needed to take everything in. And a lot of times people today, they, they spend too much time on their input ratio. They're watching YouTube videos all day long. They're not taking action. Your output ratio is your action ratio. So you need to have an input and an output ratio. And those have to be in harmony with where you are in the season of life that you're in, mm-hmm. uh, with your divine purpose that you have, and you know, based on your experience, your learning, your healing, your journey, right? Each of us has an input-output ratio. And the daily work is to figure out what is my input ratio today, And what is my output ratio? Some days I put too much in, not enough out. Next day I gotta make an adjustment. I gotta put more out that day. Some days I put way too much out, like I might be in action all day long, way too much out, not enough in. Next day I gotta go back to the lab and work on my input. Every single day, at every single season, you're working through a different input output ratio. Right now we're heading into the holidays. 
all of us should have a higher input ratio in this time than we normally do because we should be taking in family, taking in the experience of the holidays, taking in the fact that we're heading into winter. You know, We should naturally slow down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then come January 1, the output ratio should be kicking up way high because we've taken the time to recharge, to restore, to do our goal setting, to do our writing, to spend time with family, to recharge. And then we should hit, hit the ground running January 1 with our output ratio ready to go. But a lot of times people miss the input-output ratio. They get them, I, I they get them wrong. I totally see myself in that mix, like sometimes too much. Yeah. It feels like you're burning out or you have like a creative block, but it's because you've just been putting out too much. Too much. You gotta come make back. Space. Yeah, give me space. And, yeah. and so I'm always out. asking myself, am I, how is my input-output ratio today? Some days I'm called to do a lot of output, like today, serving foster children, working with you, uh, spending time with family. It's gonna be mostly an output day, right, for the most mm -hmm. part. Uh, you know, tomorrow I'll go deep into the input. I'll go, I have a cabin in Northern Arizona that I'll go spend some time at and I'll spend two days there working on just input. And then other days, you know, it's all output. So uh, I try to get the balance right on a day by day basis, on a week by week basis, on a month by month and a season by season basis. But you're never perfectly in harmony. You're always a little bit out of harmony and the, the, the walk is to try to find a way That's to good though, right? bring those balances. Yeah. Yeah, there's no such thing as, as perfect harmony. You're always having slightly, uh, uh, you, you know, you're slightly out of balance. And, and if you do have perfect harmony in a day, you wake up the next day and you won't have it, and then you'll try to figure out a way back into it. Yeah. Um, do you do you do like a New Year's resolution? Like you write a list of goals every January first? Yeah, I, I do. I, I write my goals three times a year. I do it um, New Year's. I do it on my birthday, and I do it at Rosh Hashanah. I'm, very, I'm deeply connected to my brothers and sisters in the Jewish faith and the Hebrew faith, mm -hmm. uh, because you know Jesus was Jewish, he's my hero, so I align with my brothers and sisters in Judaism on Rosh Hashanah, and I celebrate New Year with them, and then I do the Gregorian New Year, January 1st. The Rosh Hashanah is the lunar New Year, right? So that's, that's the way we used to keep time, and then we shift it to the Gregorian calendar, uh, so I celebrate that New Year's as well, so, Around September, I'm doing Rosh Hashanah. Around January, I'm doing uh, uh, my second New Year's uh, uh, intention and resolution. And then in July, when my birthday is, I do another one. So I do it three times a year. Amazing. So um, do you have any, any ones you want to share for next year? What do you, I mean, we're coming into the year. I think it'd yeah. be great, great to release it around that time, this, this yeah, clip here. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm scaling a company right now and our, our plans are to grow our business about 5x, uh, which is a lot of growth for that year. So I need to do everything that I possibly can to call in the right team members onto the team to be able to do that. So my, my work now is, is in calling in new team members to join our movement, developing my existing team members, and then uh, directing you know, that team, giving them uh, guidance and direction as to what initiatives and what our priorities are. So I'm, I'm working mostly on leadership and developing you know, my competency and my character as a leader in the year to come. And we're releasing our AI product in the new year, so my goal would be to see that product into as many hands as I possibly can in the year. Uh, and I wanna help you with that. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Tell me a little bit more about the AI product. Yeah, well, we're, we're building an AI-powered coaching platform. We're studying, uh, so I've trained the AI on thousands of coaching hours that I've done for the many entrepreneurs that I've supported. The entrepreneurs that I work with, though, pay me a significant sum of money. So I, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to get a, a group of entrepreneurs that I work with where you know, I can give them uh, advice and they can make hundreds of thousands of dollars a month if they, they implement it. So I can charge a lot of money because I create a lot of value. But uh, my objective is to be able to bring what I've learned by way of the mentors that have poured into me, by way of the revelations that I've received from the divine. I want to bring that to the masses affordably. And so we're uh, building an AI that's trained on all of my coaching sessions and all of the group coaching sessions and the thousands of hours that I've taught over the past four years since I started Alter Call. Mm -hmm. And we'll be ready to release that sometime in the uh, early January. Amazing. Or, uh, early first quarter, but we're going to have a, uh, uh, a launch in January. Is there a domain for that already or no? What you, uh, a domain name? Uh, uh, Altercall.com. Altercall.com. Yeah. So anybody that wants to check it out, go to altercall.com. 
dot com. Yeah. And was it called Alter Call GPT? What is it called? Uh, no name yet. Yeah. Um, we're 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 working through some of the ideas around naming, but uh, uh, the. The, the project is called AAI, Ultra Call AI. Uh, and so right now, uh, internally, we call it AAI. But we'll see if there's, there's another name for it. But right now, it's called AAI. Yeah, I'm interested to see what the final name becomes. You yeah. know, branding, it's, it's, especially like in this, you're, going, you're tapping into a space where uh, I feel like not a lot of people are looking at when it comes to AI. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know we're, we'll... You know, we'll see. We're doing a lot of innovation. We've hired some great scientists. Uh, we have some brilliant engineers, and you know, we're innovating right now. We we believe that uh, we're going to be able to measure some things that have never been measured before, and be able to affect change at a cultural level within companies, and then combining all of the companies that we can affect change culturally in, then we can affect change throughout humanity. So our, right now, we're uh, rolling out the product into the companies that we support. And then from there, uh, we'll you know, onboard more companies and more yeah. companies. And then eventually our objective is to be able to affect change uh, globally by way of the companies that, that we touch. Amazing. What, what do you, how do you feel about uh, the news today? Sam Altman got fired as CEO of OpenAI. I think firing Sam Altman was one of the most bonehead moves that a board of directors has ever done in the history of humanity. They're citing safety as the reason why they did it. But I suspect, based on people that are close to this matter, that it was an ego move. Um, I think Sam probably made some mistakes, for sure, would be my guess. Yeah. But what a dumb move. In Jeopardy is this, this tender offer that they were about to raise you know, at an $80 billion valuation. Microsoft wasn't even aware of it. It seems like they used safety to cover up ego or greed or fear. And you know, the structure that OpenAI had with the nonprofit governing the for-profit and the way that they engineered that may turn out to be the absolute biggest disaster in the history of, of, of opportunity. You know, OpenAI could have been the next multi-trillion dollar company, and I suspect based on what just happened that it will now uh, have the capacity, uh, its capacity now will be a fraction of what it could have been. Yeah. Because you just don't do stupid things like that. Yeah. It's dumb. And they're doing it based on, they're citing fear and, and so forth of, of, uh, of you know, safety concerns and fear concerns. But everything OpenAI is doing, someone else is copying. So there are other people out there that are seeking to take OpenAI's place. And OpenAI at best was six months ahead of other people, maybe a year ahead. And now what they've done is they've just given everybody an opportunity to catch up. Mm -hmm. And now I'll, I'll say the only thing I could be critical of Sam Altman and Bloomberg just said that Sam Altman's worldwide tour um, rivals that of Taylor Swift's, you know, in terms of what he was doing. And a CEO should be very careful not to overshadow the brand of the company. And so Sam was overshadowing OpenAI. And so I believe that that was the mistake that he made. You know, um, and I think he'll learn some lessons from it. But you don't want a CEO that's overshadowing and taking more of the credit for the work of the team than what's uh, appropriate. And I think that the world gave Sam Altman all the credit, and there was a big team supporting him, and that was his ultimate demise as the CEO of the company. Oh man, damn! It's a such a weird time. Yeah, would have it? It almost felt like okay, we're in the simulation. Yeah, this is this is the sign we're in the simulation. The trumpet. Is singing. Well, the, we are in a simulation, and and greed and fear are often masked with these ideas of safety and benevolence and some other things. And I think that this is a case study because Sam was positioning this charitable board, controlling a for-profit with a cap structure, as like the new model, and ultimately he left with an empty hand mm -hmm. because of it. So I think that, that his experiment has failed. It certainly has failed him. And that's, that's an interesting thing because when he was out there touting this on his, you know, his, his Taylor Swift tour that he was doing, I, everybody thought, well, maybe that's the new way to do you know, corporate America. Maybe these guys have cracked the code in terms of you know, how to create a for-profit with a non-profit you know, governance structure. And turns out that that structure 
uh, was a failed experiment. Do you see uh, some other company taking lead? I, know I, like I mean, I think you have, they, you know, they, they, they took the lead and, and we work with them. You know, we're, we're developers on their platform and as a customer of theirs, I'm like, what the heck did they just do? They're losing engineers, they're losing, you know, executives and they're, they're not able to serve me as a customer. Like it's slowing down and you know, there's all kinds of stuff that they got to fix over well, two there. Two days before this happened, they, they shut down yeah. people able to sign up. You yeah, can't right? sign up anymore. So like these guys are not doing the job that I expect them to do as a customer and now they're, they're playing politics. So it, it's a greed situation. And I think it has more to do with ego greed than money greed. And ego greed is, is a powerful driving force. And I would, I would tell you that the board of directors there has made the dumbest uh, mistake ever. They're turning Sam into a martyr and Sam is going to capitalize on that and OpenAI is going to get punished for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm, I mean, like I'm on Sam's, Sam's side, Yeah, 100%. I would be too. Like, yeah. you don't, you don't, like, frankly, Sam, one of the other errors that I think he made as a conscious capitalist, if Sam would have had a large stake in the company, they wouldn't have likely parted ways with him because they, then they would have been paying him to go away and they would have had to pay him for the rest of his life to go away. But since Sam had, Sam had no stake in the company, uh, it, it didn't really matter if he went away or not, right? Mm. They didn't have any vested interest in keeping him around. So I think that ultimately that their experiment may have just failed and we'll see, but there's gonna be a hundred other companies ready to take over. And the innovations that are happening from Reid Hoffman's company, Pi, or from Elon's company, or from a variety of other companies out there are, you know, these people are, were months behind OpenAI. And so now I think they're bored just allowed people the time to catch up. Yep, that's, that's literally the first thing that came to mind. Oh, there it goes. Grok is about to pull up. Right? Everybody's right. trying. Yeah. 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 Amazon. Six months ahead. Amazon's just, I feel like Amazon will, will become Anthropic, leader. Yeah. right? All of these other companies, you know, were, were at best, say, six months behind, maybe a year behind. But nobody was 10 years behind. Right, mm -hmm. and and then the people that were far behind, they got enough money to throw out this problem to catch up. Mm -hmm. So OpenAI, you know, started uh, cats out of the bag. The safety concerns that their board cited, well, I think their ego got the better of them because these safety concerns are going to be an issue no matter what because everybody's seeing the power of AI now. The whole world is, including governments and dictatorships and everybody, and everybody's throwing billions upon billions of dollars at this, and OpenAI thought they have the most important company in the history of the world, so they self-sabotaged, and just they're self-sabotaging themselves because of their self-importance. Mm -hmm. This is what happened. Wow, I would have never imagined this happening. Yeah. It's like it, shock. It, it, it's a simple case study in self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, aside all the drama, like, what excites you about AI? What's been like one? Well, The rate of, of innovation is unlike anything I've seen. I've been involved in technology since I started my career in 1995. And I was even in, involved in technology prior to that, comp coding and, and programming computers and building computers and so forth. So I've been in the, the tech world since 95. I've had broadband and wireless companies. I've worked in AI companies. I've invested in AI-powered healthcare. I've, I've done a lot of stuff in this, and the rate of innovation is unlike anything I've ever seen. So much so that if you're not careful, like you'll you'll be spending all this time and energy building something, and it'll become obsolete within minutes. Yeah. And so you have to pick a lane, pick a niche that other people are not going to focus on, and you have to build only in that niche. Otherwise, you're going to see companies go from startup to obsolescence faster than we've ever seen before. Yeah. Because the rate of innovation is unlike anything we've I seen. I mean, that happened to my, uh, my app. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, so you know, we built all these generative AI tools where then you know, just this latest release of OpenAI replaces our yeah. entire app. Yeah. So everything we were doing, everything we built over the last six months, you know, acquired thousands of users on the platform. Now, no longer, I mean, the users are there because they're loyal to us. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They're loyal to our brand. Yeah. But they could just say, 
we can just use open AI. We don't yeah. need, you know, we don't need you. Yeah. Open AI's uh, recent release put a lot of people out of business. Yeah, that's yeah. that was I was one of them. And uh, luckily for me, I have a brand that people want to be associated with. They want to yeah. they 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 want to have be part of my my yeah. AI. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. Well, you know, you're you're absolutely smart to have built your personal brand and the that that's people are going to seek more connection they'll 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 never be enough mentors to serve the amount of people that need a mentor and, and the reason why is because we're not receiving mentorship from the educational system we're not receiving mentorship from the institutions that that you know are designed to try to give us this this help we're not receiving mentorship from the church like we used to we're not receiving it from the family the fathers and mothers, they're you know, having to work two jobs or the family's um, been disintegrated as a result of the divorce rate. So we need more mentors. And that's what you are. And so you're fulfilling a very important spiritual role. And your personal brand is the way that you, mm -hmm. um, you teach. And so what you're doing is a, a spiritual act. And, and I think that that's probably the lesson is that your brand will be with you for the rest of your life. But the tools that you make you know, may become obsolete pretty quickly. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but that's, that's the truth. Like it'll, it literally happened and, you know, pivoting has been something, you know, we're all kind of like used to, um, but it makes you think deeper about what is actually that you're creating and who you're creating it for. Yeah. I feel like with uh, this, these AI tools, uh, I finally have an opportunity to scale my voice, scale up uh, without, you know, having, needing like, 15, 20 people on my team, yeah. I can become uh, a CNN. Yeah. You know, I, as a personal brand, I can become, you know, I can scale myself, my, my voice, and, and then I can really create impact without the resources that you needed before. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about this uh, new uh, wave of supporting people like you that are in the, in the light, Thank spreading you. the light. And now, you know, I'll tell you, there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. When I first started in 1995, building an internet company, I had to buy millions of dollars in servers, and I had to customize software, and all of these tools that are now available to us for, on a SaaS-based subscription, or for free in some cases, or $20 a month for mm -hmm. my ability to have a copywriter, or this or that, like we can now go build a business far more efficiently, and we're powered by billions of dollars worth of software now. It's like my entrepreneurial venture that I started in, you know, on Windows uh, 3.2 was not powered, it was powered by like $100 worth of software. The company I've started today is powered by billions of dollars worth of software. So just think about that. Like it, there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. You can do it more efficiently, but you have to learn to be a, an effective entrepreneur. You have to learn two things. And I've mentioned it earlier. You have to learn to take risk and you have to learn to organize. And if you can learn those two things, you can be an effective entrepreneur. Amen. That's a cheat code. Amen. Let's go. Let's go.